now we would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Tom Kretzley, who will present a short lecture on Andrew Jackson Davis, the seer of Poughkeepsie. Tom Crassley is a former director of the Lilydale Assembly, healing medium and spiritualist teacher. Tom has developed innovative methods for healing which achieve consistent results. His ability to combine the gifts of left and right brain abilities for healing have inspired his students for many years. Tom's joyful approach opens the hearts of all who work with him. Tom's education includes a bachelor's from the University of Buffalo. He has also studied psychology and religion at Harvard Divinity School. He has traveled extensively over 37 years, teaching and healing throughout the US and Canada. And with you now, Mr. Tom Kratzley. Boy, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, one of the things I've noted in every spirit, spiritist group that I've ever attended, there's this wonderful feeling of love. <clears throat> you know, and, it, and we talk about it all the time, but really is the essential ingredient in everything that we do spiritually. And so uh, I felt it as soon as I uh, arrived here, and, um, and I just thank you for it. And I, and I, think, it's, I think it's something that, that, that Spiritism um, has understood is needs to be the central core of everything that's done, and it's why Spiritism is um, growing and so successful in Brazil and growing around the world. And I would like to pass it on to my spiritualist friends. <laughs> so I, I'm here to talk about my favorite, one of my favorite subjects. Andrew Jackson Davis, also one of my favorite people in all of history, for the past. I would say 30 years since I've really began to explore his works, uh, he's been a constant source of inspiration to me and also a, a constant mystery at the same time. Uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, I, I'm going to break down my talk in, in several sections. I'll talk a little bit about his, his personal history and his beginning, but I want to talk about his, um, his predictions, his mediumship and really almost beyond mediumship, his, his spiritual gifts, uh, because he um, uh, stands out among mystics and, um, and mediums as one of the most uh, uh, extraordinary in, in all of history. And those people who heard him, those people who reported on him in the 19th century uh, were equally amazed by what he was able to do. And also the story, the, the, the story of his history, his personal history, uh, is unremarkable from the beginning. Uh, he was born in poverty, a uh, little uh, north of New York City. And for the first dozen years of his life, there was nothing really remarkable that ever happened to him. Now, many mediums that I'm aware of, that I've met over the years, uh, they'll tell me stories about how their mediumship was present with them from the time that they were uh, very young and the experience of engaging with, uh, with, with, with spirits and so on uh, from the time they were three or four. And my wife is a medium and she tells me these stories all the time as well. But this is not Andrew Jackson Davis's story. Uh, he had uh, glimpses of things in, a, in, his, in his teens, but they weren't... Um, they weren't great flashes of insight. They were just temporary glimpses. When he was a young man working in the fields, uh, he had this uh, spiritual experience where he heard something of the music of the spheres, this brilliant, wonderful music that had him uh, pause for a moment and just engage in the essence of that music. Uh, but nothing more came of that. And um, when he was... Um, uh, a little older, this is this says something about his character, and one of the things that I, I'd like to examine uh, um, in in the course of this talk is what was it in his character, what was it in his makeup that allowed him to achieve what he achieved. Uh, his mother was um, uh, was really his spiritual support. You know, his mother was. Uh, um, a, what he would describe later as a primitive Christian. <laughs> uh, 
And, um, but she had a deep, uh, a, a, a kind of a deep natural faith, which she passed on to him in some ways. And she also had a moral character, which she also encouraged and supported in, in Davis. Uh, his father, on the other hand, was, uh, was an alcoholic. He was a shoemaker. And his father was always critical of him. Uh, from, uh, from the time he was very young, his father would tell him repeatedly that um, he would be of uh, no use in the world and that he was essentially useless and couldn't do anything. Uh, in addition, when he was young, he was rather sickly. So all of these factors are, are, are um, not what you would expect of someone who would become one of the greatest uh, mystics and mediums of all time. But as he, uh, as he grew older, I want to report an incident that, that, that kind of um, uh, addresses this element of character. When he, when he was a young man uh, in his early teens, he was on an uh, expedition. He had borrowed a friend's horse, and he was in a, a, in a local town. And there were some young men, hoodlums there. He, he described them as, uh, basically, they were up to, up to no good. And because he was a stranger in town, they were, they were about to pick a fight with him. And so he, he, what he described was being able to stay in his center and not be agitated by their, um, by their attempts to excite him and get him engaged in a fight with them. And so he, the, the engagement with this uh, group of young men went on for a, a period of time when one of them um, jumped him and started to pummel him. And he was aware at the time of not resisting it and still holding this sense of, of seeing them and being with them in a kind of a neutral space, neutral ground, if you will. And even when he, the young man who beat him uh, jumped up, he jumped up his, himself, he got back up and got on the horse and went back home, uh, he didn't react. He didn't react with anger. He didn't react with, um, with disgust. He didn't react with any of the kinds of normal emotions you, we would expect ourselves to react in those circumstances. Uh, however, he did feel the pain, and he said he did cry. And um, some months later, he met this same young man uh, in a store. The young man didn't recall him. And he eventually became friends with this man, this young man. They became good friends. And the young man later told him that he had... Um, uh, that he, he was struggling internally with himself, morally, over something that had happened uh, months, ago, months earlier. And Davis got him to confess what, what it was. And he said, well, you know, I, I attacked this, this boy, and he didn't realize at the time that the same boy was right in front of him. It was Andrew Jackson Davis. I attacked this boy, and I pummeled him, and there was no good reason for it. And, the, and he said, there was no anger coming from him. And he said, I can't, I have a hard time living with this. And uh, Davis told him, he said, don't worry about it. I'm that, I'm that young man. And I think that's a really amazing story when, when, when we think about how many of us would have that kind of uh, moral strength to turn the other cheek to that degree. So anyway, he, does, he becomes interested later on um, in mesmerism. And at this point, he's, he was about 17 years old when this happened. And at that point, he, um, uh, he engaged the services of a, uh, of a mesmerist. And when he was put into trance, it was discovered that he could do medical clairvoyance. Uh, very similar to what Edgar Cayce uh, had done in the 20th century. And so, on a daily basis, uh, for several years, the operator, the mesmeric operator, would put him into trance, and for two and a half hours at a time, and he would do a couple of sessions a day, he would uh, do medical clairvoyance, give accurate medical diagnostic descriptions of the patient's cases, and, uh, and also prescribe cures, and in some cases, rather strange cures. Um, 
I'll give you an example of one. There was uh, a, a man who had come to him and wanted to know, uh, uh, had had um, some problems with his ears and deafness, said he, and um, he was told to take 13 weasels, cut off the back legs of the 13 weasels, and in particular, the, um, the section of the legs uh, where, where the, uh, the knee joints were, to boil those and strain it off, take the oil from that, and put in several drops a day until the oil was completely used up. And that would cure him. Well, it was so, um, so strange um, to, to the client that they didn't go about affecting the cure. But he, he goes on to describe the reason why this was, that there was, the elements are, are so rare in the weasel's hind legs um, that they could only be found in sufficient quantities in that substance um, to be able to help and affect a cure, which makes some sense to me. Uh, anyway, that's just one of the cures, but there are many others that, um, um, that people followed and got, um, um, and, and got their cures and were healed. Uh, and he did this for several years uh, until about... Uh, two years, two and a half years into it, they decided to start asking him other questions. Questions about the nature of, of, of the universe and the nature of, of life here on Earth. And the result of that series of, of trances, which went on for about a year, and it began in 1846, was the first book, Nature's Divine Revelation, A Message to Mankind. And in this book, there's the cosmology of, uh, of uh, uh, an entirely new cosmology based on what, um, what was a very popular uh, idea in the 19th century, natural law. It was the idea that by studying nature, you would have a deeper understanding of the nature of the divine. But there was, uh, and I want to read to you something that was included in Arthur Conan Doyle's History of Spiritualism. And this is, a bit, this is referring to those sessions. First of all, he said that uh, there, uh, a more ignorant man could not, a young man could not have been found in the state of New York. Uh, and this is true, he had all of three months of education. And, uh, in those months, he, was, he describes himself as an abysmal student. Yet he, had, yet he was still a curious nature. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a good student in school, but he was always curious about things. So here's the account of one of those, of several of those sessions by, um, by a witness, and there were several people, a number of people in New York society who were witness to these trans lectures. And this was a, a Dr. George Bush, professor of Hebrew in, at the University of New York, who was one of those present while the transorations were being taken down, writes, I can solemnly affirm that I have heard Davis correctly quote the Hebrew language in his lectures and display a knowledge of geology which would have been astonishing in a person of his age, even if he had devoted years to the study. He has discussed with the single most ability the profoundest questions of historical and biblical archaeology, of mythology, of the origin and affinity of language, and the progress of civilization among the different nations of the globe, which would do honor to any scholar of the age, even if in reaching them he had the advantage of access to all the libraries in Christendom. Indeed, if he had acquired all the information he gives forth in these lectures, not in the two years since he left the shoemaker's bench, but in his whole life with the most assiduous study, no prodigy of intellect of which the world has ever heard would be for a moment compared with him. Yet not a single volume or page has he ever read. So I want to give you some more examples of, of some of, of, of what came through in that first book. And I recommend, there's a book I recommend, highly recommend to you. It's called Andrew Jackson Davis, The First American Prophet and Clairvoyant. And it's, uh, it's a fairly recent publication written by a Dr. John DeSalvo. 
uh, who's also a good friend of mine. And, and uh, John DeSalvo is also um, something of a scientist. He was a, uh, has been a professor of anatomy in a number of universities, but also a lifetime um, study of met uh, lifetime student of metaphysics. So here are a couple. Of, here are just a few of the things that he dealt with in the, in, in the cosmology and understanding and his capacity to see and engage with um, the greater universe. He predicted or saw, let's say, he witnessed before their discovery uh, the planets Neptune and Pluto. In March of 1846, Davis said that there were nine planets in our solar system. At that time, astronomers only knew of seven. Neptune and Pluto were yet to be discovered. Um, in September of 1847, a full six months after Davis predicted its existence, um, uh, it was uh, discovered by, uh, uh, by astronomers. Pluto was not discovered until 1930, which was 84 years after Davis' uh, prediction. Davis also stated that Neptune had six satellites or six moons, a term he used for moons. Um, later scientific information confirmed that there were in reality eight moons encircling Neptune. However, six small moons were closely orbiting the planet and the other two were much further out, which suggests that he, his perspective at the time he was witnessing this might have been closer into the planet than um, uh, then would allow him to see or observe the two moons which were further away. Davis also discussed the atmosphere of, diff of the different planets and uh, the composition of these atmospheres which were later um, corroborated by, um, by space probes and Voyager 2 flybys. Venus, he described also in the book, uh, Nature's Divine Revelation, the surface of Venus. He said, there are very high mountains and ejected rocks that disturbed an otherwise smoothness of its appearance. Some of these are several miles higher than any upon the Earth. This too was validated by um, Venus space probes. Saturn, in his observations of Saturn, said, in Saturn he said, Saturn had more moons than any um, planet in the solar system. Now, up until recently, it was uh, thought that Jupiter had uh, more moons than Saturn. But recently, scientists have been discovering more moons. Saturn does have more moons. There are now, at this point, 18 documented moons of Saturn, and more are continually being discovered. Now, let's get into the, um, the, the, the makeup and the formation of the universe, the movement of our solar system. And this is a passage directly from Nature Divine Revelation. The wonderful sun or center to which our solar system belongs is but a remote planet of another system existing prior to its formation. And in accordance with the general classification of suns and worlds in the universe, its planets and satellites or moons may be considered as satellites and asteroids belonging to a planet and that planet as belonging to the sun. And this of course refers to the movement of our solar system around the galactic center. And actually, the first confirmation of our solar system uh, motion itself was um, was made several months after Davis's statement by a professor Maidler. He determined that our solar system is moving around a point in the direction of the constellation known as the Pleiades. Scientists know, now know that our solar system revolves around the center of our Milky Way galaxy, a single revolution requiring many millions of years to complete. The Big Bang. And this is, this is interesting because it describes so much of the, uh, of the, the modern physics that, um, that we understand uh, with respect to the Big Bang. So I'm gonna read this. Is, this is from, for, for Davis, the word that he uses for the universe is univerculum, okay? So in the beginning, the, the univerculum, the universe, was one boundless, indefinable, and unimaginable ocean of liquid fire. The most vigorous and ambitious imagination is not capable of forming an adequate conception of the height, depth, length, and breadth thereof. There was one vast expanse of liquid substance. It was without bounds, inconceivable, and with qualities and essences incomprehensible. 
This was the original condition of matter. It was without forms, for it was but one form. It had not um, motions, but it was an eternity of motion. It was without parts, for it was a whole. Particles did not exist, but the whole was as one particle. There were not suns, but it was one eternal sun. It had no beginning, and it was without end. It had not length, for it was a vortex of one eternity. It had not circles, for it was one infinite circles, one infinite circle. It had not disconnected power, but it was the very essence of all power. Its inconceivable magnitude and constitution were such as not to develop forces, but an omnipotent power. Matter and power were existing as a whole, inseparable. The matter contained the substance to produce all suns, all worlds, all systems of worlds throughout the immensity of space. Now this, this description that uh, Davis has, uh, um, has of liquid fire actually is very close to the idea of plasma, which, was, um, which scientists and physicists have theorized uh, was the state of the universe shortly after the Big Bang. Now, he also talks about the existence of ether. Now, scientists now are beginning to come back to the idea that there is an ether. And it's, this is one of those debatable, um, uh, um, I don't know if we can call it facts or theories about, um, uh, about the universe and the makeup of the universe. But ether goes all the way back to the Greeks. And Davis um, also talks about ether, but he uses a, a different term. He uses the term electricity. His electricity therefore pervades the infinity of space. It penetrates all substances and exists in and throughout all worlds with all their component parts. It exists in everything and everywhere, and there is not one particle in the realms of infinite space that is not within its composition, the unparticled and active agent of electricity, being that ultimate or the progressed and perfected essence of the great eternal sun. It pervades all. And there are some scientists now who are doing experiments that seem to suggest that this is um, that ether or this electricity that Davis, as D Davis describes it as, is, um, is a very real part of our, uh, of our universe. Brownian motion. And what is Brownian motion? It says, when you look at a small dust particle suspended in water under a microscope, they all appear to move in a random fashion. No particle is stationary. Uh, what gives all, this, all particles this property? The motion was discovered by um, a Scottish um, uh, plant expert, Robert Brown. But then in 1877, it was um, further elaborated on um, by, by uh, another scientist, De Salt. So here's Davis's. If motion were given to one particle in the great mass composing the sun of the universculum, this would establish mo motion in every atom in existence. Unified field theory. Now, um, in quantum mechanics, uh, it explains how things work, uh, that, that uh, um, it was postulated uh, by Einstein that there would be a, a, um, a unified field theory that would explain all of the forces um, uh, in, in subatomic uh, particles and so on. So here's uh, what Davis says about this. Heat or caloric has been supposed to be governed by a law different from that governing light, and electricity being as yet undefined to be governed by a different law from the last two mentioned. A different law cannot govern any particle or element in the universe. This constitutes the grand general law that government governs all elements in space. And finally, the one that I think is most important for us spiritually is the theory of evolution. Davis really says that evolution is an attribute of the divine. You know, there is no, there is no distinction. You don't have to say that, you know, it's like, well, there can't be evolution because there's a God and God created. There's, and it, it was probably one of the most controversial elements of his, um, of his cosmology. And he realized that as he was uh, proposing it, that it would, um, um, that it would bring a, a great deal of controversy. You know, and, and more than that, as a matter of fact. But, um, so his theory of evolution 
uh, came about 10 years before Darwin. And what he says of this is, man is a culmination of universal nature through progressive development, probably the most repulsive feature of this philosophy to the uninitiated inquirer is this proposition, that man came from animal creation. Mm. Okay, let me see if there's anything more. Uh, there were a number of things in his capacity to predict, and I want to um, share one, one that has much more of a, a personal slant to it here. And he's, um, he's on a train between uh, Buffalo and Cleveland. And as I mentioned earlier, he actually became very well known in his time and was one of the most um, uh, uh, celebrated, certainly the most celebrated clairvoyant of the age. Uh, but people knew him for his writing and his writings uh, spread around the world. So they knew him from his, uh, uh, his pictures that were, uh, um, that were in, the, in the books. So he was recognized by a man on the train and uh, this man somewhat accosted him. Okay, he said, while in the cars between Buffalo and Cleveland, an elegantly dressed but shabbily minded individual recognized me, advanced and asked, can you tell how the sun looks outside our atmosphere? I have never personally risen beyond our atmosphere, I replied. Yet by impression and clairvoyance, I have viewed the sun from space and can therefore tell you how it appears. Taking the cigar from his mouth and puffing a column of fetid vapor into the air that I was breathing, he said, I'm posted in astronomy, sir, and I can tell you whether you're right pretty darn quick if you answer my questions. Well, said I, with a momentary emotion of the ludicrous, what are your questions? If you know how our sun looks from a distance, he replied pompously, tell me. From the Earth's surface, said I good-naturedly, the heavens appear filled with light, as you know by observation. But should you ascend to the outer rim of our atmosphere and look toward the sun, you would see a rayless ball of fire steadfastly burning in a universe of night. The sun would present no atmosphere, the countless stars would emit no scintillation, and the now azure sky would seem like a black concave immeasurable. Fudge, he exclaimed, that's all spiritual twaddle, sir, all darn nonsense. What reason can you give for what you've been saying? The reasons are very simple, said I quietly. Light is equalized on the earth by the operation of two causes. First, the perfect absorption and refraction of the sun's rays by our atmosphere. Second, the reflection of light thus diffused by bodies on the earth's surface. The questioner seemed a little less irritable now. Some say the air is cold in space. Is that so? Yes, sir, said I. The temperature at a distance of 45 miles from the globe is lower than any cold known to man. What do you mean to say that it's colder up there than at the North Pole? Yes, sir, I answered. The intense cold in the regions of eternal snow is almost warm weather when compared with the upper air. Look here, don't pile up the agony in that horrid way. Just tell the plain truth for once and see how it would sound. The plain truth is more wonderful than fiction, I replied. Therefore, till the fact is found out and people choose mythology instead of spirituality and pictures instead of, um, instead of realities which daguerreotype them. Um, about this air cold up there, he replied. Aren't you confoundedly mistaken? As he spoke, the superior condition flashed upon me and instantly detecting more truth in regard to the cold, I replied. Chemists can produce a lower temperature than that which prevails at the Arctic Circle. They can convert carbonic gas into a solid substance and quicksilver would become firm as iron. Yet this intensely freezing temperature, about 150 degrees below zero, is warmer by nearly 80 degrees than the cold of the upper realm. The reason I include this is because this is at a point in his life where he was able to acquire or step into the superior condition at will and retrieve any information that he wanted and still maintain conscious awareness. This is where Davis, uh, in many respects, is different in his gift 
from, um, from the likes of Edgar Cayce. And there's a, a story that's tied up with this shift in his consciousness that when he went from the, that somnambulic state into what he called the superior condition or the, spir uh, or the spiritual state of consciousness, um, it goes back to the, uh, the title of his book, uh, his first autobiography, because he actually wrote an auto uh, two autobiographies. The second, second half came many years later, and that was called Beyond the Valley. But the first, uh, uh, the first book of the autobiography uh, is, um, is The Magic Staff. And The Magic Staff is about his encounter with spiritual guides, and his two, um, his two primary spirit guides were the Greek physician Galen and Swedenborg. Um, I don't want to get too much into Swedenborg, but Swedenborg was uh, uh, a great um, uh, 18th century mystic uh, who wrote the book Heaven and Hell. But anyway, these, this, these were his, his guides. And it was a point in his life when he was, um, he was involved in doing the, the medical diagnostics and being in trance every day uh, uh, for several years on end. And at that point, he, at a certain point, he started to get depressed. And he, what he was depressed about was the fact that he would go into this, these trance states and then not be able to remember any of this stuff, even though people were saying it was good stuff, it was good information. Um, he was depressed about that disparity in consciousness between his normal waking state, um, in which he was relatively ignorant, and the state of consciousness where he, he, he had access to all this knowledge and information. And this disparity led him to, um, um, to a depression, and it was in this depression that he, um, he prayed constantly for days for, for, for some insight, for some support. And it was at that time that he was given these words to live by, under all circumstances, keep an even mind. But it was more than words. It was a real visit, spiritual visitation. As he reports it, when the words came to him, they were, they were illuminated in gold. And they were, um, they were deeply embedded in his consciousness. And secondly, they told him to rely on it, to, to lean on these words. This was his magic staff, to lean on these words, rely on them, live by them, trust them. And by all accounts, he, he embodied that thoroughly. He was able to um, have this great epiphany where he was able to embody that thoroughly. And within a short period of time after this, um, this epiphany, he started to be able to become conscious of these high trance states, become self-consciously aware while they were going on. And to me, this is the great central core of what Davis has to teach us. It's really about what we're here um, to do, and that is to become more conscious. Davis was about more than mediumship. His, his whole life, to me, was, was, um, was a statement of, of spiritual liberation and, um, and the liberation of the human mind. And over and over again, he talks about these issues and about freedom, the, the freedom. In fact, he, he, he authored a, um, for a, a publication in Connecticut. He authored a, a, a little treatise called The Spiritual Declaration of Independence, in which he talked about the ills of society. He listed them all. He Ill, listed the ills of society, the, stru the structures of society, of, um, uh, of the economic structures, the social structures, the religious structures, and all that was limiting about those structures and in a way condemning them and declaring himself free from the limitations of those structures. And for him, anything that, was, anything that limited one's um, curiosity, anything that limited one's intellectual perspective or capacity to perceive um, was an evil. It was, it, that's what was wrong. That was the only evil in the world to him. 
And so his life was a demonstration more of that. He, he certainly um, knew that spiritualism was coming. He knew uh, it was in, in, in one of his books. I think it might have even been in Nature's Divine Revelation where there's a passage where he talks about there's a, there, there's a, a demonstration coming soon to the planet um, that will prove um, the connection and the existence of, of spiritual worlds. And it was short, certainly shortly after that, it was in 1848 that the Fox sister phenomena um, was, uh, uh, was, was public and, and became all the, all the rage. But I do believe that without Davis, the phenomena of spiritualism as it occurred in the, in the, in the US in the middle half of the, the 19th century might have only been a fad. He provided a very important philosophical, uh, psychological context within which that phenomena could be more readily understood and accepted um, by the larger general public. And, and, and truly, without his, um, uh, his lead, I don't think as much would have happened with um, the phenomena of spiritualism. Davis himself began to pull away from spiritualism. Um, uh, about 30 years into it, uh, he felt that there was too much emphasis on, on the phenomena. And, uh, and that emphasis led to uh, charlatanism, which, uh, which of course he abhorred, and all true spiritualists uh, abhorred. But he also felt that it was, it, it was important that um, the philosophy, the greater philosophy, um, uh, be understood and practiced, that it wasn't just about um, the mediumship, it wasn't just about connecting to the other side. It was about life here and making life here better. He was a very practical man when it came to his spirituality. Another aspect of his work, which I think is absolutely, because I've been working counseling for um, 40 years now, is his psychology, his understanding of the human mind. He had a perceptual model of, of, of psychology and spiritual development. In this perceptual model, there were seven states of consciousness. Um, the rudimentary state, which is animal, animal um, state of consciousness. The psychological state. Um, I'm not gonna get into uh, um, uh, great descriptions of because this could take a long time, but. <laughs> Um, there is so much um, material in Davis, and it's very difficult to pare this down, but I want, I want you to um, just get a sense uh, of this. Uh, the sympathetic state, and I'm going to read you some, some, some examples of, of Davis being in these different states. You, I've already read you an example of the superior condition. Um, the sympathetic state, the transition state, the somnambulic state, which is the state he was in when, he, um, uh, when the first book was, uh, uh, was delivered. And by the way, after the first book, the other 29 books, he actually wrote them himself. They were not, um, um, they were not scribed by, uh, by another person. Um, and uh, back to the psychology. His understanding of psychology was really profound for the time. He spoke of things like prenatal psychology, which I don't think has really been a much of an issue until the last, uh, let's say, 30 years at the most. And, not, and, and in terms of mainstream psychology, not even that, that important until recently. But here's an example, and this, is a, uh, this comes from uh, a, a, a visit that he'd gotten from a, uh, uh, a client. <clears throat> and the client, uh, uh, and, and this is what happened in that, in that connection. On one occasion, I was visited by a very respectable clergyman of New York who said the devil tempted him at least once every week to commit suicide. This was proof to his mind that there was in reality a living demon who exerted himself energetically to destroy both soul and body in hell. I inquired if he was not diseased. He answered that his health was perfectly good, but he, de he desired me to make an interior inspection of his condition. I did so, and instantly discovered that his suicidal temptation originated from the psychological influence of his mother's spirit upon his mind before birth. Of this I immediately informed him. 
Oh yes, said he, my mother has often told me that the devil tempted her in the same manner. But I was soon enabled to inform him that his mother's mind was agitated by a disease of the liver and diaphragm, which invariably produces mental depression and sadness under certain conditions. And a tendency to suicide was a common feeling to minds thus affected, especially when associated with small hope and feeble resolution. This explanation was rather too rational and unsupernatural for the clergyman, and it overthrew a strong evidence of the devil's existence. So he didn't believe a word of it. You know, and he's uh, frequently throughout his career, he is faced with that. Um, one, one of the things that I wanted to share with you was how he dealt with um, the prejudice that existed all around him. And remember, I, earlier I spoke about this sense of balance that he was able to maintain. Here is an example of, of, uh, of that uh, in his life. Prejudice is impudent as idiotic and merciless as erroneous. Of this, my private history is a demonstration. Minds too blunted to feel a truth and too indolent to examine a principle are the first to cry mad dog and shout infidel. Hoots, hisses, and silly exclamations reach my outer ear almost every day. Sunday school boys would chalk vulgar words upon our cottage fence and gateposts. Students of Cicero, Xenophon, Locke, Bacon, and Divinity would echo in public the ridicule which salaried professors oftentimes whispered in private. And young ladies, too not overstocked with that charity which thinketh no evil, but imbibing in prejudice of preachers or minister or parents, all equally misinformed, would nervously ejaculate cunning little epithets and harmless satires with which they sought to check the progress of our movement. What was all this to me? Amusement and nothing more. So I have this great respect for our for the, those who started things in our, in our religions because they dealt with a lot of prejudice. They dealt with a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of struggle, a lot of difficulty in, in, in life. Now, I have a couple of things I do want to uh, share with you. These are other quotes from Davis because I want just to get a sense of this is what Davis felt we're all headed for. And we're all headed for something even beyond mediumship. We're all headed for the superior condition. In all this then, you may behold a prophecy of what Father God and Mother Nature have in reserve for every son and daughter of humanity. Not that all men will pass through a mystical ordeal of magnetization, but that immutable laws of mind will sooner or later waft each soul into the superior condition. When is with the bee and the angel, the only and sufficient guide to good and truth will be that totality of divine life in the soul, which I celebrate under the name of intuition. And I'll finish with one, one bit of advice. And this is, this is kind of just advice he gave to live by. In conclusion, let me urge you to get wisdom. This is the great savior. Know thyself, be simple-minded devotee of nature's laws. Have a good and benevolent reason for everything you do. Never act from a narrow or selfish impulse. Be loving and tender-hearted. Always remember that happiness depends upon physical and mental tranquility, upon individual and social harmony. Never do wrong, for while I speak, there are thousands of pure and loving angels looking upon us, desiring our speedy deliverance from discord and error. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Tom, for this great testimony. Thank you.